So what have we been doing in linear algebra? We have been looking at vector spaces. So some kind of plus and scalar multiplication operator, things we work with. And remember, we were just doing vector subspaces at the end there. One of the big criteria that we've really tested for is like, can you add any two things and get another thing in the set? And if, it, if you can't do that, then it's not a vector space. But lots of interesting things are vector spaces. So we can count on this if it is one. And we can multiply any element we like with that, uh, with a real value if we want. So what does that open up for us? What does that get us? This is the payback for being in a vector space is that we can freely and safely build all sorts of different elements. So let's imagine we have this many vectors. So imagine a set of vectors. What new vectors could we create from this? So this is a set of single elements. Well, of course, we could build things like v1 plus v2, because we can add safely. Uh, we could also build, of course, let's call it a1. a1 times v1 for any a1 real. We can safely multiply by v1 by anything, or we could multiply v2 by anything. And if we start combining those things, we could do a sum of those, sorry, let me get the subscripts matching here, a2, v2. Oh, because this is just a new vector in the set. This is a new vector in the set, and I can safely add any two vectors in the set and get a new vector. This sort of cascade of things that we're allowed to combine safely can build up to the point where I really don't want to put that dot, dot, dot there yet, because we can then extend that to three vectors if we want. Pardon me, V2, we could throw in a third vector. Because we have associativity, we could associate these. This is a vector in the space. Oh, and then it's just one vector plus another vector. At each stage, all we're ever doing is either scalar multiplying, which is safe, or adding two vectors, which is safe. There we go. So yeah, so in fact, we can do that all the way to the end, right? We can add any combination of the vectors themselves and their scalar multiples. This turns out to be an incredibly broad set of things that we can build with it. And so we give it a name. We give this possible list of my vectors scaled by arbitrary numbers out front, arbitrary reals a linear combination of a set of vectors. So if we have a finite collection of elements in our vector space, it doesn't have to be the whole thing. So we just grab you know three real numbers out of all the reals, then we can talk about linear combinations of these where we take any one of the vectors and we multiply them by any real number that we care to pick or use alongside of it. So if we take reals as our set, I can talk about the two elements of that, five and seven, just picking two randomly, and then a linear combination, for example, would be you know, 17 times five plus 23.794 times seven. So this would be, this is our a1 and this is our v1. They look the same because we're doing reels to reels, but this would be a linear combination of the two elements that we just talked about, five and seven, where we are allowed to multiply them by any random number that we want, as long as that multiplier is a real number. It gets more interesting when you get to vectors. So it's more, a little more, a little more representative of the kind of things we usually do. So if we're looking at these vectors here, which are all in R3, then we could write this as an example, as I'll take four of the one zero zero vector. I'll take 7.9 of the zero zero three vector. And I'll take, I could take zero if I want of the one minus one two vector. And that zero isn't handy sometimes because if we don't want something to play a role in our sum, we can make it zero. And in general, do this in a different color here. In general, 
the linear combination would be like a one times one zero zero plus a two times zero zero three and a three times the one minus one two. So we have just some multiplier of each of the individual components, each of the individual vector elements, and we are allowed to combine them with any scalar multiple and add them together. This can also apply, especially in differential equations, with things like, hey, cos and sine. I could take, as a concrete example, 3.5 cos of t uh, minus 7 sine t, or in the general case, oops, or in the general case, it could be something like, well, it'll just be not something like, it'd be some number times cos of t and some other number times sine of t. In fact, I'm gonna choose different constants here for a second because we did this before. We said, hey, let's have an A of this and a B of that when we were building solutions way back in uh, calculus one. So some arbitrary combination, some arbitrary scaling of the cos and scaling of the sine added together at each time point. That can be a linear combination. And yeah, the A's here are random or arbitrary. With it, the idea is if we just have them here blank, they're kind of anything we want them to be until we find a purpose or until we find a goal. But the idea is we could put any number there if we wanted, and this would still be a valid linear combination. And this sum would still be in the set that we care about here, R3. Yeah. Now, why do we look at linear combinations? There's this idea of reach, and we're going to put a couple of different synonyms on there. But let's take a look at R2. So x's and y's. We've got the vector 1, 1, 2. Excuse me. Uh, so 1, 2 is up here. There we go. That's v1. And v2 is the zero one vector, so it's here. So that's V2. And the question we're gonna ask ourselves is what parts of R2, this entire plane here, how, where in this entire plane, any point I want, can we reach with linear combinations of V1? So for one example, if we scale V1 only, then of course, all we can do is cover the line that v1 is on that looks 45 degrees should look 45 degrees let's go back to here like that that's a bit better so if we have v1 and we're allowed to take multiples of v1 all these points satisfy a1 times v1 for some a1 in the reals all right in other words scalar multiplication you've seen this before uh, along a vector so i can scale a vector i can flip its direction but that's basically all i can do if I scale V2 only, well, not too surprising, we can get all this line here. This would be like A2 times V2 for some A2. But the fun part comes when we combine them. If you think about any point on the plane, let's just grab any point here, random point, random XY. Well, I can get there. It's going to be a little convoluted but I can get there by following V1 for a while and then following V2 for a while and get to here. Well, that means that this XY can be written as some A1 times V1 plus some A2 times V2. Now, if you think about it, we're gonna show more proofy type approaches to this later on. Then you pick it, you you pick a point of the plane, you just get your own plane here, you pick a point, can I get to there with these two vectors? Well, absolutely. If I follow this vector back, and then I follow the vertical vector, let me try that a little better there, vertical vector also backwards, then, oh, I can get to this point. Pick any point you like, I can always get there through some combination of the V1s and V2s. So this is interesting. We can, reach any xy in R2 with 
a linear combination, this is how we'd phrase it, a linear combination of v1, v2. I'll put the vectors on there just to make it obvious. We'll have to prove that at some point, but it feels geometrically like that's totally valid. Is that always going to be the case if I just pick two vectors, uh, R2, two vectors maybe? Well, hopefully I already have some intuition on this, but it can't just be any two vectors, right? If we take one vector, it's called W1, that's one, two. There we go. There's our W1 vector. What could make problems for our reach, our extent, the things, uh, the set of points that we can combine and, and reach? Well, if we pick another point that happens to be, oh wait, parallel, then, oh, well, that's not the same. Now, all we can reach, uh, so any, any A1 times W1 plus A2, W2, is only on this line, sad base. So yeah, parallel vectors cause a problem here. Now, it'd be better if I could draw them a little more accurately here. Let me give it one more try. All right, it's good, it's good as we can get, all right. Okay, so what are we seeing here? We've got spaces, we've got vectors that we can pick out, and somehow we're getting this teaser of Sets of vectors can either be combined, so this linear combination, they, the two vectors themselves don't cover the space, like this vector and that vector, they're just two vectors. But linear combinations of them are an incredibly broad set of points. And here, it's such a broad set of points, it's any point you can imagine in the 2D plane. However, sometimes some redundancy can creep in. And if we have two vectors that end up here in parallel, well, then all of a sudden we can only reach, we can only reach points on the red line, emphasizing not all of R2, of R2, with linear combinations. And I'm going to short form this a lot because we are going to use the phrase linear combinations a ton uh, of W1, W2. So somehow having these parallel vectors in there is different than having two vectors that are not parallel. That's going to be to turn out to be the easy 2D intuition. It's going to suck when we get to 3D. I'll warn you right now. <laughs> All right, but we're feeling the differences. I'm teasing this out. Now, what's interesting is if we start combining some of these things and we just imagine the kinds of coverage we can get, let's go to 3D here for a second. Uh, so we have a known vector space. R3 is a known vector space, right? Now we're talking about subsets of it. What were we talking about this week? We're talking about vector subspaces. So let's take a look here. Um, let's take a finite number of elements and you know what, let's just do two of them. We're gonna, we're gonna take two, V1, V2. So already intuitively, if I only have two directions that I'm gonna be building off of, I don't think I can get everywhere in 3D space and that kind of makes sense. So let's, it's gonna be a weird drawing in 3D, but let's imagine this is what it looks like, V1, V2. So we pick a finite number of building block elements. And then we imagine the subset of R3 that we can cover with any a1 v1 plus a2 v2. Uh, and we see what you can build here. Hopefully, based on your APSC 172 experiences already, you should have an intuition. What can you build with these two vectors? The two vectors I drew here, what do you think? Only on a plane, exactly. If you take those two building blocks, Try to draw an illustrator here. And, uh, what you're going to get is a plane that contains those two vectors, 
that doesn't contain the normal vector to it. So that would be the third dimension we're going out into. Uh, but yeah, we can build a plane. We'll lie on a plane. And notice this plane will also be through the origin, or through 0, 0, 0 here. I'm going to slide that in because that's one of the key factors for being a vector subspace, right? So this is a little different than calculus. Calculus, we had our planes moving away from the origin. They could be anywhere. They could be spaced. They could be stacked. These planes that we're talking about are going to always include the 0v1, 0v2. We can always include the zero point in all these planes. We're not going to have planes that are offset. So it's a little bit different. And yes, you'd love to stay in 2D. Gosh darn, it's too bad that engineering often involves, funnily enough, at least three dimensions. So uh, doing the same kind of thing, we can extend this idea of building blocks and sets to things like subsets of C infinity. So for example, this is, a little, this is a lot harder to draw, but functions, remember, this is functions that are continuous and infinitely differentiable. And so in that set would be things like the set one, the function one, the function x, and say x squared. So these are a finite number of elements, little seeds or building blocks. And if you think of all of the functions you can build with linear combinations of these, this would be, let's call it a times one, b times x, plus cx squared, this is all possible quadratics. Quadratics. There we go. So if you want to talk about any possible function that has that quadratic form, you can have y equals x squared. You can have y equals minus x squared. You can do the shifts of the vertices and things like that. You have to be careful. This is not the xy plane in the same way we did before with vectors. This would also include the zero function. The zero function is an element of this. Uh, it's an element of the linear combinations here because zero times one plus zero times x plus zero times x squared is in the set, is included. But any any parabola, basically any parabola you can imagine is made up of a constant, an x and an x squared term and including things of lower degree as well. So linear or constants, those are all in this set and we can build them by three simple building blocks as our start. All right. And so just going back to the conversation about direction vectors there, uh, negative does flip direction but it, it doesn't change the direction. Even if you take W1 and you flip it by a negative coefficient, well, it just goes and points through back through the origin. It doesn't go perpendicular. It goes in the same line, just opposite direction. So we can't get off this line with negative numbers. Okay. So linear combinations, you can already kind of, I hope you can feel what we're doing here. So we've got big sets. Those are vector spaces, that's great. And then we can kind of narrow it down and say, well, what do I need to build a space? Well, I can build one or two vectors together. And then by combining them and scaling them, by adding them and scaling them, I can get to a lot of other points. And so we're kind of looking for seeds, like what, what's the smallest possible set I can build? Um, and how do I do that? How do I talk about this relationship between a few building blocks and the places I can reach in my big space with them? So we're introducing a new word for exactly that which is span. So if you have two vectors in whatever space, v1, v2, and you imagine all the things that linear combinations of v1 and v2 can be made to create or be made to equal to, that's equal to the span of v1, v2. So we can define that as a nice set notation here. Everything here, blah, blah, blah. Sorry, it has to be at least one element. Um, so we can define S of V1, V2. 
or other ones to go all the way up to VP. I think this might be on the next page. No, it's not. Okay. Uh, it's a set of vectors that are in, let's call it vector W, Ws that are in our big space V, such that W is some combination A2V2 plus APVP for some A1, A2 to AP in the reals. So you can think of this as a function in some sense where someone gave me these building blocks and I'm allowed to take those and scale the first one, scale the second one, scale the last one, add them together, whatever I can make, the, the catalog of things I can make with all these tools, that is the set I'm interested in. That's gonna be all the Ws I can make and it's gonna be some subset of the bigger space we're working in or maybe equal to, but uh, this is the formal definition of the span. Anything I can reach by adding and scaling my building block set. All right. The fun part of this is we're actually getting an easier route to something we've already done. So earlier this week, so this was Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever we had our classes, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, we went this way. We took a known vector space like Rn, so all the vectors, some dimension n, and we made some rule for selecting the subset. So we've had examples like, uh, we wanted all the x, y's in R2 that had x plus y equals one, or all the x, y's in R2 that had x plus y equals zero. And then we asked, was that definition, which is a subset of all the R2 things, was that a vector space or not? And how do we know? We had to go through the three rules, three axioms of the zero vector is in our set, had to be closed under, think about these for yourself as we're going through it, closed under addition, and also closed under, think about it for a second, scalar multiplication. And honestly, that was a bit of a drag, not gonna lie. <laughs> That's a lovely thing to be able to do. And what it led to is we found out that in fact, no, that's not a vector space, but this one actually was. So, all right. But this is an alternative route. This is today. If we have the choice, if we have the alternative, maybe in a different scenario, we're picking some elements of our set. So let's, let's say pick our one, two vector and the zero, one vector, like we did a couple of pages ago in R2. And then we just build the span of that. So any combination, any linear combination, some multiple of the first plus some multiple of the second, that set, if we add up those things for, for any A1, A2 in the reals, automatically is, is a vector space, vector subspace subspace. No checks required. No, no three axioms required. Now, you might be wondering, is that why? What? Hold on. If you take a look at the definitions that we're looking for, well, I always had the zero vector in there because I can always pick a zero multiplier for each of these things. And we learned earlier, if I multiply by zero, the real value is zero, I get the zero vector in my space. And you can see that here. If I multiply zero plus this plus zero times this, I'm going to get the zero vector. So we're guaranteed that zero is in the set. Is it closed under addition? Well, we're in a vector subspace to start with, or a vector space to start with. So I'm sa I can safely add these things together and I'm going to get something else that's in the set. So we're going to be closed under addition with coefficients one and one, and I'm closed under scalar multiplication because that's how I'm building my set in the first place. I'm guaranteed, I'm only taking things that are closed under addition. So these are two different ways with a rule that we then have to check whether we have the three axioms satisfied or with building blocks that we pick or are given. And we can automatically assume that the span, not the set themselves, these two vectors by themselves are not a subspace. But if I say, what can I build? What can I reach? What can I get to 
by taking linear combinations of those building blocks, that is guaranteed to be a vector subspace for real. So this is a bit meta, so to, to take some time with it. I'm just going to show the compare and contrast here for something like C infinity as well. So uh, we know C infinity is a vector space. So it follows all the rules. I can add functions and there's, they stay functions. I can scale functions. They stay functions that are continuous and infinitely differentiable. Again, Monday, Tuesday, we looked at some Tuesday, Wednesday, just once a week, apparently to be earlier. Uh, we looked at rules, like we said, what if f of zero is equal to three? We also looked at uh, what if the derivative of the function was equal to the function itself? And then again, we had the three axioms, just like before, I won't regurgitate them here. And we found out that this rule did not satisfy those three axioms, but this one did. We could find all the functions that equal their own derivative. Those were like e to the x's and their multiples. That was a great vector subspace. Uh, these functions here did not include the zero function, the constant zero value function. So that was not a vector space. And we could do that stuff. That was fine. But we could also build sets of functions like sine of t, cos of t, or like we just did a second ago, one x and x squared. And then if we build the span, in other words, all possible linear combinations of these sets, again, the set sine cosine is not a vector space. It's two points. Vector spaces are huge. This is two points. But if I linear, if I allow myself to make linear combinations of them, some multiple of sine plus some multiple of cos, I'm guaranteed that we're going to have a vector subspace with that set of possible linear combinations. All right. Sorry, I'm seeing the chat here. I'm just going through that. Uh, do we know how to do, you have to know how to do both. So first off, if you look at your homework for this week, guess what? A lot of it is this uh, homework slash, sorry, I mean like web work and tutorial problems. This is more just a feature that we're going to be exploring. So this is a new way to look at it. We can prove this part here that the span will automatically be a vector subspace. But what we're going to do is explore what this means, just sort of knowing, knowing now that if I pick seeding elements and I try to build spaces out of them, there's some things I can rely on, specifically all the axioms from vector spaces. So when we look at these guys, it's more going to be what can I, how, how can I apply this to a certain applic to a certain analysis question? I think that's actually coming up right now. Actually, sorry, no, here. We're going to do the proof first. All right. I'm going to prove this chain here that if we pick some elements of any subset, sorry, of any set that is a vector space, and we just say, all right, now I'm going to allow myself to build any linear combinations at all that I can possibly build, then we do get a vector subspace. I want to prove that for real. Well, guess what? <laughs> We're going back to <laughs> this chain here. Our rule now is I can take linear combinations of these sets, but I do have to prove at least once that these three axioms here are actually satisfied. So let's do that once and for all so that we never have to do it again for this approach to building sets. And so how we're going to do things. So very proves these material requirements that the span of any finite set, blah, 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 will always be a vector subspace. All right. So our set S is equal to uh, I'm going to write it the way we usually write it. So A1, V1, all the way up to AP, VP, uh, which is an element of our superset V, where A1 to AP here is some element of the reals. Okay. So one. is the zero vector an element of S? Yes, oops, yes. We can pick A1 to equal A2 to equal all the way out to AP, which equals zero, element of the reals. A1 times V1 then is equal to, so zero times V1, that's going to equal the zero vector in V. This is proved that 
zero dot of vector equals the zero of vector uh, in week two. One of, the, one of the consequences of being a vector space is you can build the zero vector by taking the scalar zero and multiplying by any vector. And of course, that means that a2 v2, zero times v2 is the zero vector as well. So by the time we finish this set, a1 v1 plus a2 v2, all the way up to ap vp, it's just the zero vector plus the zero vector plus the zero vector a whole bunch of times. And that equals the zero vector by the uh, v plus zero equals zero axiom. Anytime I take a vector and add it to zero, I get the same vector back. Oh, the, I'm just starting with the zero vector instead of v. Sorry, let me equal that. What am I talking about? Equals v. And then we're just using the zero vector instead of v here. So I can take a stack of zeros, add them together, and get zero. I get feel silly saying this out loud to people who've been doing this their whole lives, but that would be the formal way to present in linear algebra using the axioms we have that the zero vector is in S. So zero is a linear combination, combination of V1 to Vp. So in other words, I can build a zero vector as a linear combination of the building block vectors. All righty. In terms of proofs, again, we're going to give you sample exams to work with, sample midterms, things like that. And you'll see it's either prove the thing, like I just said, so this rule here about the zero, zero scalar times any vector gives you the zero vector. We would ask you to prove that specifically. Here's the context, show the proof. or any other kind, any other time you can just use it. That's something we have proved, it's something that's in the bank, we can just pull that out. We should say something about it ideally, rather than just kind of throwing it down the page like this. Um, having some explanation for why you're allowed to do that has been proved is enough though, if it's not specifically the focus of the question. Continuing on our theme, two. Um, is W closed under addition? Absolutely. Uh, is, sorry, did I call it W? Is S, let's call it S. Is S closed under addition? And think of how we did these themes in the last two lectures. If I want to show that something is closed under addition, I need to pick two elements of my set, add them together, and show that they're part of the set. So pick two elements of S, and let's call them v1. And here's where it gets a little hairy for notation wise. Actually, no, I'm going to call it v. I'm going to call it v and w. v will be, no, I already have v's. Ah, so, okay, w. I'm going to call it w. So a1, v1 plus a2, v2 plus ap, vp. All right. Any element of my set is a linear combination. So some linear combination of the v's. We're allowed, our set is made up of any linear combination, so we just pick one of them. And let's call it w, and let's take the other one, w, v, let's call it r. And we'll make it b1, v1, plus b2, v2, plus bp, vp. All right. Another linear combination of our Vs, right? That's what it means to be in our set. Our set S is the span. The span is any possible linear combination of our individual Vs here. And then we add them. And we're gonna ask, is that, is that sum inside our set? Well, W plus R, I'm gonna take a shortcut. We know how this addition works. Uh, I've got V1s and uh, yeah, we're gonna do it. We can write the sum here as a1 v1 plus b1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus b2 v2 plus a bunch of other stuff plus ap vp 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 all right now we have the distribu distributivity distributivity axiom 
which says that when I have this V1 and this V2 and this VP as a common factor, I can pool the coefficients out front and V2, V2, and where does that get us? Uh, it gets us at the end, AP, BP, VP. But this is an element of the reals, it's just some new real number. This is an element of the reals, and this is just some element of the reals. So if we just scan across here, I have some real number times V1, some num real number times V2. Hey, that is an element of S because it's a linear combination, linear combination of V1 to VP. It's a new one. It's a brand, brand spanking new linear combination, but it's still part of the definition of what it means to be in our set S. That's some new linear combination. It's something we can reach with it. Just pause there for a second while people are copying, and then we'll do the, I think, staggeringly obvious consequence or follow up to this, which is, first of all, this is not one, this is two, uh, which will be condition three, close under scalar multiplication. It's going to look almost identical to this, only we're going to take one value, one, one vector at value, and then we're going to multiply it by a scalar. In fact, I think I skipped over here. Now I'll slide an extra page, page. So three is S closed under scalar multiplication, scalar multiplication. Yes, let uh, W be A1, V1, right to AP, VP, and let's make it K be an element of the reals. So we pick an arbitrary element in our set. We pick some arbitrary real number, and what we're going to do, of course, is multiply them to see if it's also in the set. Then K times W is equal to K times A1, V1, A, P, V, P, and distrib distribute distributivity again. I think I might be missing a syllable. If I am, I apologize. Uh, this is A1 times K times V1, plus a bunch of other terms that all have the same pattern, AP times K times VP. Guess what? This is still a real number. This is still a real number. So this is an element of S2. So if we scalar multiply any two, sorry, scalar multiply any element of our set, multiply by any number you like, you're going to get a new element that's still a linear combination. And our set is all linear combinations, so we're covered there. So that this kind of proof is the kind of thing you can memorize it or you can kind of just follow the structure of it. But the key thing is it allows us to take a shortcut under these certain conditions. So again, if we had a vector space that we know about and someone says, I'm going to, I'm going to build a subset, and there's two natural ways to build one. One is, here's a rule. I kind of make it up. It could be anything. These rules can be like these two rules here look nothing alike, but it's like, I like functions who, which, which when I plug in zero makes three. Okay. I like functions that when I take the derivative, I get the same thing back. Okay. Those you basically, you're going to have to go back and look from scratch. Am I satisfying all three rules of the vector subspaces? Zero vector, closed under addition, closed under scalar multiplication. However, it's also very common to say, I've got these building blocks. <laughs> I've got these little Lego blocks. I want to know what I can build with two by two and four by four Lego blocks. Okay. Well, then we're going to build all the possible linear combinations out of those. And what we just proved is you don't have to go through the three axioms anymore because we just did it for any possible case. If we're talking sine and cosine, one, x, x squared for functions. If you're talking two vectors in R2, talking any of these things, we have already, we've just proven that whatever you just built is a vector subspace. Guaranteed every single time. If you look at the span of some set, you're in business. Why do we care? <laughs> this is not gonna be a super motivating example either, but this is, this is one of the reasons why we care. Sorry, just doing a quick time check. Linear equations. I 
can't emphasize this enough that when you get to real scale engineering problems, like if you're looking at fluid flows, if you're looking at truss designs, you get 100 by 100, 1000 by 1000 systems of linear equations really easily. In fact, you just treasure the moments when they're linear and not nonlinear. And it turns out that what we just covered here has a surprising connection to linear equations. Let's tease that out. So I'm going to connect what looks totally separate, solving equations and vector spaces. They don't look the same at all, but there is a connection here. All right. Here's a system of three equations and two unknowns. Okay. X1, X2 are two unknowns. We have three equations. There it is. All right. How, let's try to connect this to vectors. So the xi's is coefficient of R3 vectors. Well, if we take a quick look here down the column, if I put x1 and I pull it out of all these things, I have x1 times 1, x1 times 2, and x, sorry, x1 times 2, x1 times 2, and x1 times 4, plus x2 times 3, plus x2 times 1, plus, minus, Let's do it this way, plus x2 times negative 1 equals 1 equals 3 equals negative 3. I've done nothing. Mathematically, I've done nothing except really flip the order of some of these things, notice that some of these coefficients are 1. But I can take it one step further and say that that is the same as the vector 1, 2, 4 plus x2 times the vector 3, 1, negative 1, 3, 1, negative 1, and equaling 1, 3, negative 3. Now, these are column vectors, not row vectors, like we saw in the last couple of pages. In practice, we just kind of look in context and go, I like writing these as columns. We could write them as row vectors. It'd be the same mathematical structure. Uh, this is just takes up less space. That's usually the reason why we do it. Uh, we'll see other reasons when we get to matrices. But, but this, if you went element by element and said, well, x1 times 1 plus x2 times 3 equals 1, the first component of that is that equation there. So the first component of the vector equation is this. The second component is this. The third component is this. So those are two identical equations. But now, what does the left-hand side look like? This looks like a1 times v1 plus a2 times v2. Oh, that looks like a linear combination of two vectors. All right. We have vectors now, we have scalar multipliers, we have forms like this. That means we can take the question of, does this have a solution? Does this have a solution? If we look at it like this, this collection here with all possible, all possible x1, x2s is equal to the span of 1, 2, 4, and 3, 1, negative 1. So the question is, can I, pick, can I find an x1, x2 that when I add them in this way, gives me this right-hand side? Another way to ask that is, is this output vector, is the vector 1, 3, negative 3, our output, right-hand side, in the span of... 1, 2, 4, and 3, 1, negative 1. And mathematicians get super excited, and engineers less so, but somewhat so, you get super excited when you can turn what was one framing of a problem, linear system of equations, does it have an answer, finding it's a separate thing, but just even doesn't have an answer, and I can turn it into a totally new form, because maybe this is going to be easier to answer or give me an insight into when I know about solutions existing and things like that. So this hasn't helped us find an answer faster, but it's a new way to look at an old question. Like this is the kind of thing you would have done since about grade seven-ish, six, seven. This is a meta version of it that, has, that gives us new tools to work with. 
So span is the new concept for the day. It's all the places I can reach with these two vectors. And so you can think of it in 3D here. Uh, yeah, I've got 3D vectors. I've got two vectors that I'm working with, vector one, vector two. We just said a second ago, that's probably a plane under certain conditions. And then we're asking, hey, is this point here on the plane or is it off the plane? That is the same as asking whether this has an, this system of linear equations has an answer, has a solution. So it gives us a whole bunch of new tools to work with. Let's quickly breeze through some of that and look at cases where we do get answers and where we don't, because you're going to see some uh, patterns. So this, if we look at the coefficients of the x1 and x1 here, that's a vector 1, 4. And square brackets, round brackets, use whatever you like uh, for vectors here. This one has x2, and we put the scalars afterwards usually, equals a, b. So we're being asked to use a span argument to prove that no matter what values are picked for a, b, there will be a solution to the system. So how can we use a span argument to this? Well, think about the span. Sorry, our new question is, is the vector a, b in the span of 1, 4, and 2, negative 3? We're going to wave our hands about this a little bit. Or we're going to use a geometric argument, which comes to the same thing. Uh, if we take the vector 1, 4, vector 1, 4, and this x, y, and the vector 2, negative 3 down here, 2, negative 3. So you can write vectors either way here, but I think it, I like lining it up with the way it was presented to us. But we're thinking about it as vectors in the same way you always have. If I ask the question, can you reach any point AB? Someone comes along and says, AB's out here. Can I reach that with these vectors if I'm allowed to do linear combinations of them? And the answer is, of course, yes. We just go back down this vector for a while and then maybe a bit further like that. And then let's put this in red. I would follow this vector up. So I can reach point AB with some linear combination of those two things. And just from looking at it, we can tell the span of 1, 4, and 2, negative 3 is all of R2. It's all of R2. And that means that for any AB, AB is in the span of our set here, 1, 4, 2, negative 3. And that means that for any AB, our solution, our system of equations here, x1 plus 2x2 equals a, 4x1 minus 3, uh, minus 3x2 is equals b, has a solution. So that's, I think, a new way to imagine this. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes, sorry, 4114. Wow, I totally got that wrong. Yes, thank you for that. The vector 1, 4 should be up here. 1, 4 should be this way. You're absolutely correct. I was so busy worried about the column versus row here that I wasn't thinking x and y. Thank you for that. Uh, so that kind of ruins my AB example, which I'm just going to erase right now because it's wrong. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'll add another AB later on. So linear algebra, linear algebra is power right now. This does not look like a geometric question. This looks like solve some equations. But by turning it into a vector equation with unknown coefficients, and this left-hand side looks like an arbitrary linear combination of two vectors, the 1, 4, and the 2, negative 3. My solution is to find some x1, x2. So I'm allowed to use any x1, x2, and like, oh, any, I'm allowed to use any real number I like. Well, that's a linear combination. All possible linear combinations is a span. So I can get with these two vectors here, 
not that way. I can get to with these two vectors here anywhere in the plane. I want to go over here. Sure. I go back that way. Uh, I can go back that way enough a little bit. I can get to any point in the plane with those two vectors. And so the span of those two vectors is all of R2. That means that I can solve any equation. I can solve this set of equations for any right-hand side. What we're going to see is that's not always true. And again, you can feel what we saw earlier, something about parallel vectors, blah, blah, blah. Uh, imagine these two things here, these two equations, the two unknowns. The vector version of this is x1 times, well, there's a one out front here, so one and negative three. And if I take x2 out front of these ones, I have negative two and six equals ab. So, so far it's exactly the same set of equations that we were looking at, just put in vector form, so that's fine. But then when we start drawing it, if we draw the vector one, negative three, I'll get this right, yeah. This is the vector one, negative three, or one, negative three. And hey, negative two, six, looks an awful lot like that. Or negative two, six, whatever you like. Well, guess what? Those are parallel. Ah, that's a drag for solving equations because now we can guarantee that if I pick an AB out here, would have no solution. So if I picked a point, just let's say one, one here, I can just look at this picture and say, yeah, there's no way I can reach the point one, one if I'm only allowed to use these two vectors. And the consequence is that if A and B doesn't lie in this line, there's not gonna be a solution to this system of equations. So that's the kind of thing that we can uh, flip our view on. Right now, if you think back to the skills you have, if I said solve this equation, you'd like, okay, I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna try to solve this. Now we've got a geometric way to look at it that says, you don't necessarily have to solve it or not solve it. I can find out just by looking at this picture, if you give me a point, whether it's going to have a solution or not. So it's a new way to look at an old problem. All right, so I think I think I have like five more pages, but I'm not going to get through. All right, uh, yeah, I don't really want. To. I think this this is bonus stuff, so yeah, we won't do that because I think we're basically out of time anyway. Oh my goodness, yes, we are out of time. So we'll stop there for today. You'll see some examples of the logic here, both of just building linear combinations. So this part of things and then a little tie-in to the vector space uh, and solving linear equation stuff when you look at, think of the web work and tutorial problems for this week. So we'll pause there with, at the new concept of span linear combinations of building block vectors. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to stick around. Otherwise, I'll wish you a good weekend. <laughs>